Good afternoon, everyone. I cordially welcome you all for the 11th lecture of the short course on cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology. Today, we're focusing on the law, dispute resolution, and adjudication. The program for today is such that the lecture is scheduled to be for 45 minutes with a short break of five minutes, followed by another 30 minutes of the lecture and a question and answer session. May I now have the honor of introducing our guest lecturer, His Lordship Honorable Justice Yasanta Kodagada, Judge of the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka and President Council. Honorable Justice Yasanta Kodagada was called to the bar as an attorney at law in 1988, and since then has had numerous important appointments in both the local and global arena. A few of such appointments held by His Lordship include President of the Court of Appeal of Sri Lanka, the second in command of the criminal, criminal division of the Attorney General's Department, additional Solicitor General, legal advisor to the Financial Intelligence Unit of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, visiting lecturer at a number of institutions, including the Sri Lanka Law College, Universities of Colombo, Sri Jawadanapura, Kalania, and KDU, <coughs> and counsel representing the government of Sri Lanka in an anti-terrorism investigation conducted by the Metropolitan Police of the United Kingdom. In addition to these, His Lordship has also rendered his services and expertise to the Criminal Investigations Department of Sri Lanka, the High Court and the Magistrate Court of Sri Lanka, and the Judges Training Institute of Sri Lanka. Our esteemed guest received his primer, primary legal education at the Sri Lanka Law College and holds a master's degree in public international law from the prestigious University College London in the United Kingdom as well as a postgraduate diploma in Forensic Medicine and Sciences from the University of Colombo. His Lordship has also presented and published many international and local level papers on themes such as criminal justice response to child abuse, rights and entitlements of victims of crime and witnesses, law and practice relating to bail and corporate criminality. Sir, we're profoundly honored to have you with us here and we warmly welcome you to deliver this lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Navya. Um, let me uh, start by sharing my screen with all of you. This afternoon, uh, I, I propose to uh, discuss with you uh, three very important uh, topics, the law, dispute resolution, and the administration of justice. I, I do understand that a uh, vast majority of you uh, have not had any um, education in law as a subject, uh, though you may have uh, read and studied certain areas. Therefore, on the understanding that uh, your, your vast majority of you are not students of the law, I'll keep my presentation very, very basic and simple uh, so that uh, most of you could understand what is being said. Let what law is. Now, there, there are various uh, philosophical and highly academic descriptions of what the law is. Um, I will give you a practical insight of what law is all about. Um, basically, the law contains a set of rules. Um, and, and also when I say rules, you, you will thereby understand that it is an imposition on us by someone else and that there is a compulsion on us to adhere to or follow such rules. Um, basically, these rules, the set of rules referred to as law, is aimed at and in fact results in uh, governing of human behavior. That, that is in fact the primary objective of uh, the law. In, in any civilized society, uh, there is a need 
on the one hand to protect both individual as, as well as collective freedom of the people, but that freedom has to be regulated and on certain occasions controlled uh, for the larger benefit of the society we live in. So in as much as we are born free and can realistically expect to lead a free life that would enable us to speak the way we want, conduct ourselves in the way we want, interact with others in, in the manner we would like to, do things that we would want to, etc. cetera. Um, society requires us to exercise that freedom, which is also referred to as autonomy, subject to the rules of law, uh, because there is a need to control as well as regulate our behavior for our own good, as well as for the good of the other members of the society that we live in. Now, the law governs not only us as individuals, the, the law governs the state. Uh, you know what the state is. The state is the, the executive, the, the legislature, and the judiciary. They act on behalf of us, the, the three organs of the state, uh, act on our behalf uh, in, in any uh, organized society. So the law governs the state as well. The law governs companies, corporations, uh, organizations. So the law not only governs individual human beings, it governs the state, uh, companies, corporations, organizations, associations, etc., as well. Now, um, laws contain different characteristics. Some laws impose on us prohibitions. We, we are prohibited from or barred from doing certain things. Good example would be killing another. Is that prohibition created? It is created by law, by the recognition of the fact that one person killing another constitutes an offense. And in this example, the offense is the offense of murder. So on the one hand, the law contains a series of prohibitions, which these prohibitions take the manifestation of offenses, also synonymously referred to as crime. And since there is a prohibition in law, the violation of that prohibition is what constitutes the offense. In that example, the offense of murder, and the law also stipulates the corresponding punishment, the punishment corresponding to the violation of the prohibition. So that's one area of laws. Another very important area of law are rights and duties entrusted on us by law. Our fundamental rights, the rights that we have with regard to numerous other things, such as holding property, associated rights, when, when you have property, associated rights relating to such property, such as the right to sell property. Those are rights that we derive. The law also imposes on us duties, numerous duties, 
good example would be the duty of care towards others. Take for example, a person who, who wants to dig and construct a well in his compound. He has a right to use the proper rights to dig the ground and construct a well. Now that's part of his rights. It arises out of his right to property. Now, corresponding to that, he, he doesn't live by himself. He lives in a particular environment comprising of neighbors. Now, adjoining this land are, are the properties of various other people, and on some of those properties, you would get construction, such as houses. You may get vegetation. You may get trees, etc. Now, this person who is constructing the well in his own compound has what the law recognizes as the duty of care. The duty of care to ensure that while he is constructing the well, and as a sequence of the well coming into being, he does not collaterally cause any damage to the property of his neighbors. That is referred to as the duty of care. So on the one hand, there are substantial rights and duties, and on the other hand, the law also imposes numerous forms of additional duties, such as the duty of care, which I explained a short while ago. Now, there is a segment of laws which prescribes the procedure to be followed when attending to certain things. Maybe incorporating a company, submitting an application to obtain a license for maybe a license to drive a motor vehicle, a license to carry a firearm, the procedure to be followed when engaging in certain forms of business activity, the procedure to be followed in court cases, etc. So there is this body of law which merely prescribes procedure to be followed in numerous matters. And, and that area of law is referred to as procedural law. Now, it's, it's interesting to focus on this issue of who imposes on us law. The philosophical approach to this issue arises out of the view that the law was created by God We've, we've moved away with the evolution of human civilization. And today, we, we identify both individual human beings as well as a collection. In, in, in modern society's context, uh, laws are created and imposed by either individuals or by groups of persons. And in a, in a monarchy, in a monarchy, as opposed to a republic, laws are are created, or at least the primary laws are created by the monarch. 
the king or the queen. And, and all power to be closed also arises out of monarchical power. The monarch is deemed to have the supreme power to make laws, which is also referred to as plenary power. The parliament or various other uh, lawmaking bodies that have derived the power to make laws from the monarch, from the king or the queen. Now, in contrast with a monarchy, you We seem to be having an unstable connection. Can you, can you hear me and see the screen? Yes, sir, you can be heard and the screen can be seen. Thank you. Um, so we, I, I, I hope you heard the description that I gave about uh, a monarchy, and, and I did say that a monarchy has to be distinguished from a republic such as our country. Um, in contrast with a monarchy, in a republic, the power which is also referred to as the sovereignty lies with the people. And since the people cannot, in, in a complicated society, in a big society, directly exercise power, people have created to the country's constitution three primary organs of the state, and be executive headed by the president, the parliament, which is referred to as the legislature, and the judiciary. Uh, to exercise executive, legislative, and judicial power on behalf of the people, and of course, in the Sri Lankan context, people have, in addition to those three powers that they have vested in three organs of the state, people have directly and the right to franchise, and that is the right to elect representatives. Those, those rights are exercised directly by the people. And of course, there is just one instance, and I hope I won't be complicating you, uh, when I say that lawmaking power is also exceptionally speaking exercised by the people and that is on the occasion of a referendum be that as it may uh, in in a republic the primary lawmaking power is vested in the legislature which in sri lankan sri lanka is referred to as the parliament so it is the parliament that makes laws. We will we will now in slightly more detail see whether see as to who and who and to what extent make primarily as i said uh, laws are made 
by parliament however in view of the devolved nature of sri lanka in so far as law making power is concerned which is which can also be referred to as legislative power it is not only the parliament that makes laws uh, in addition to the parliament there are certain laws that can be made by provincial councils and uh, very very small laws made by local government institutions such as municipalities and pradeshya sabha now primarily the law making power is with these three categories of bodies the parliament provincial councils and local government institutions now in addition to the parliament's law making power it is necessary to recognize the fact that in in exceptional situations in terms of our constitution limited law making power has been vested in the president who serves as the head of the executive the reference here is to the power given to the president by the constitution as well as another law referred to as the public security ordinance the public security ordinance to make certain regulations referred to as emergency regulations these regulations ladies and gentlemen are made for the purpose of protecting national security public order and for the maintenance of essential services and supplies so that's a exceptional situation where the the president has been empowered with law making power finally the judiciary also has law making power and that is twofold firstly the the judiciary in terms of sri lanka's constitution has the the power to prescribe rules relating to lawyers being admitted to the bar that is the enrollment of attorneys at law relating to their disciplinary control and professional ethics as well as making procedural rules relating to procedure to be followed in court cases that are heard in the supreme court and the court of appeal so that's limited law making power but secondly that i said is the first area of law making power the second area of law making power vested in the judiciary is not all that evident ex facie they they relate to an area of law that is referred to as the common law in the area of common law which is also referred to particularly in the united kingdom as judge made law in the course of deciding cases we are called upon to interpret provisions of the law to fill in lacuna in the law as well as for the purpose of ensuring the delivery of justice we sometimes slightly and not so evidently but slightly expand the boundaries of law so that can also be viewed as an instance of judges making law finally there is this separate body of law referred to as international law 
these are laws made by the international community, particularly through um, the functioning of international organizations such as the United Nations. Now, international law is over there, but certain areas of international law has an application was within the country. And, and there are certain rights and duties that we derive uh, in the arena of human rights, in the arena of environmental protection, um, and, in, and in numerous other areas, there are rights and duties which we derive directly from international law. So that also must be appreciated. Um, let us very briefly, without taking much time, look at um, the different categories of law. There is the written law versus unwritten law. Written law, ladies and gentlemen, it's not complicated. Written law is a reference to the laws that are enacted by parliament and by other lawmaking bodies. Unwritten law is the body of law which have not been enacted by parliament but over a long period of time come into being through judicial activism. You remember I told you about the inherent power of courts to interpret the law, fill in the lacuna of law, and at times where justice demands to expand the boundaries of law, the, the judgments that we deliver contains these features, particularly judgments of superior courts, such as our Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal, contains these forms of judicial activism. And that has developed over a long period of time, a set of rules. Uh, one example would be the rules of natural justice. Another example would be the doctrine of proportionality. A third would be uh, the doctrine of necessity, the concept of fairness, principles of equity. These are very important areas of law which come within the spectrum of unwritten law. They are, they are judge-made law. And where are they found? They are found in judgments of superior courts. They are found in treatises written by respected authors, including academics. So that's written law. And earlier, I referred to unwritten law. I, I also did explain in the previous slide uh, the distinction between domestic, that is national law vis-a-vis international law, the relationship between these two laws are also very interesting, but possibly today's topic is not one that would necessitate me to speak about the relationship between national laws and the international law. I did refer to the difference between substantive law, which creates rights and duties, vis-a-vis -vis procedural law, which governs the procedure to be followed. Then there is the criminal law. And, and once again, I, I did refer to uh, prohibitions in law, which necessitates us to control our behavior and not engage in certain conduct, which is harmful to the others. Thus, the law has created prohibitions. These are referred to as offenses, and the violation of these prohibitions carry punishment. 
that's the characteristic that's the unique characteristic of an offense so that the entire body of offenses is found in criminal law then the civil law um, i'm not going into these details uh, about sub classifications of the civil law you which you would see here in the slide let us let us stop for a moment we are going to uh, enter into the second segment of my presentation this afternoon disputes what are disputes ladies and gentlemen disputes if you if you think about it carefully you will realize particularly after i define is uh, as students in in your universities uh disputes are very common in fact i would go to the extent of saying that disputes are unavoidable as well and is very much linked to our being human uh if you really look at the dispute that you have with another person may it be a family friend uh, a family family member a friend a colleague a superior a subordinate uh, a dispute you may have with your lecturer with a fellow student a dispute you may have with the administration in the university a dispute with the state if you really look at the very nature of a dispute uh, a dispute signifies a disagreement a disagreement between two or more persons regarding one or more specific issues so those of you who live in hostels would may have a, a minor dispute with a friend living in the same hostel as to who should go to the washroom first you may have a dispute with your examiner as to the marks given for a particular subject uh, you may have a dispute with a family member on the sharing of resources you may have collective disputes where a group of persons have a dispute with another group of persons so disputes are a Uh, unavoidable occurrences in our day to day lives as i said in our personal life as well as in our uh, other environments it's it's basically a disagreement between two or more parties on one or more issue if you go beyond you will see that disputes relate to material things like property like money disputes relate to rights rights and duties in fact uh, disputes can arise with regard to the exercise of power by persons in authority may it be a military officer a police officer a government official hmm, exercise of power there can be disputes in relationships um, with family members with your spouse with your boyfriend or girlfriend there can be disputes then there are disputes founded upon our identity and generally our collective identity such as our nationality the language we speak our religion and various other sub classifications in society these are related to our 
both of individual as well as of collective identity. You, you would recall for 27 years, there was an armed conflict in this country. And, and if you really go into the, the root causes, it had a lot to do with the collective identity of the Sinhalese and the Tamil communities of this country. Um, so this, these are identity related issues. Um, and, and I would end by saying, a dispute is likely to occur in every sphere of life, in every aspect of your life, time and again, disputes are likely to occur. And that is the very nature of human life. Now, if a dispute is not resolved in, in, a, in a timely and in an appropriate manner, there is, the, there is the every likelihood of the dispute getting aggravated because it is not resolved. There is the likelihood of the dispute getting aggravated, it becomes more serious, and it takes then a new form, which is referred to as a conflict. A dispute that is not resolved in a timely and fitting manner is likely to become aggravated into a conflict. A conflict is quite similar to a dispute, but more serious in nature. The existence of a conflict can result in um, a serious deterioration in the relationship between the disputants. Um, it, it, the conflict itself is likely to give rise to uh, further disputes. Take, for example, Two, two siblings, two brothers who return home after school. Uh, there is a dispute as to who will get the first lease of using the bicycle which is at home. After returning from school, they, they want to play. And there is a dispute between the two brothers as to who should use the bicycle first. Now, that dispute is not resolved in a fitting manner, they, they are likely to get a little irritated or even angry. And, and by evening, unless this is resolved, it is likely to uh, get aggravated into a conflict with maybe the two people decide, two brothers deciding not to talk with each other. They may then start fighting over uh, who should go first to the washroom and then take a change of clothes. Uh, they may start fighting over uh, using the remote control to access and change channels in the television. So uh, what I'm trying to say is, uh, if a dispute is not resolved in a timely manner and in an appropriate there is every likelihood of the dispute getting aggravated into conflict and the existence of a conflict is potentially dangerous and there is every likelihood that during the pendency of the conflict um, there is likely to be more and more disputes erupting between the parties. And, and it is necessary for you to note that the existence of conflicts can be very harmful. It can be very disruptive to the relationship between the parties. It can give rise to even a complete breakdown in the relationship. We will take a moment to, to see how people in society 
either respond or react to disputes. So take your your take yourself as an example. Uh, you have a, a dispute with a friend in the same batch. How will you respond to that dispute? Um, there's a slight difference between responding and reacting. Responding for this purpose involves the use of your brain, thinking about the issue, and then deciding on a course of action. A reaction is more spontaneous, like, like looking the other side, like um, scolding somebody, like slapping someone. It's a reaction. A response is carefully considered, contemplated, decided upon, and then implemented. Now, if you look at the broad range of responses that we adopt when we are confronted with a dispute, um, I see three broad ranges. On the one end, fighting, extreme solution. It can be a fight involving words, like in an argument. It can be a fight involving physical force. It can be a fight which involves aids to fighting, like the use of weapons. So fighting is at one end. At the other end, which is like the starting point in most disputes, is avoidance, particularly with the view to protecting the relationship that you have with the other party with whom you have a dispute. You may choose not to respond at all, to take things lying down. You, your dispute may be with your quote unquote best friend in the university um, and, and you develop a dispute over some issue, maybe a political issue, there is this disagreement on, on a political issue, on some national issue, say. Uh, but you may decide not to argue with your friend because for you, the underlying relationship that you have with your friend in the university is more important than, than impressing upon your friend that the view he holds on this national issue is wrong. So avoidance is, is a response that we choose either when the dispute is so very trivial that responding is not worth it, or because you fear that by responding to the dispute, you may injure the relationship. And in your case, the relationship is more important than who wins at the end of the dispute. Now, in between these two extreme options, fighting, not responding at all, which is also referred to as avoidance. There is a broad spectrum of responses which involve communication. These are very peaceful responses. It involves communication, mostly talking, either between the disputants only or with the involvement of third parties. These are very peaceful. These are aimed at peacefully resolving the dispute that has erupted. Um, so these are, ladies and gentlemen, the peaceful responses that are available. They are given names, negotiation, mediation, 
conciliation, contractual adjudication, arbitration, and judicial adjudication. We certainly don't have time to go into the nitty gritties of all these responses. They can be also referred to as mechanisms for the full resolution of these issues. But I'll, I'll try to simplify it as far as it is possible. Uh, so negotiation is, is a discussion. It can be either an unstructured discussion or a highly formalized structured discussion. So you have this dispute without necessarily arguing with your friend in the badge. You will merely discuss and try to reach agreement on the disputed matter. That's an episode. Um, and we, we engage in negotiations all the time. You go to the polar and there is a trader who is selling vegetables at a particular price. You feel that he, his price is exorbitant or unnecessarily high. And you speak with him and try to bring down the price to the level at which you would like to purchase the vegetables. That's a negotiation. You've seen in television films, uh, negotiations between representatives of companies, uh, negotiations between representatives of governments at the international level. Those are all uh, negotiations. We move on to the next step, which is referred to as mediation. <coughs> Mediation involves the arrival of a third party who is referred to as the mediator, who will mediate, who will attempt to facilitate the disputants to resolve the dispute among themselves. That's mediation. So, Mediation can also, as in the case of negotiation, happen in a highly structured environment or even in our normal life. Uh, haven't you come across a situation where you have a dispute with a sibling and your parents just advise you to, to try to resolve the matter amongst yourselves? That's a mediation of sorts. Um, then there is conciliation. Conciliation is quite similar to mediation, quite similar. The, the difference is this third party, the intervener, who, who, who is there to support you to resolve the dispute, will initially encourage you to resolve the dispute, understand each other's problems and resolve the dispute. And if you fail to agree on a solution to the dispute, he will make a recommendation. He will tell you, in his view, the most suitable way to resolve the problem. <laughs> now, this happens in, in society, in, in routine society, in situations where there is some dispute among relatives. Isn't it customary for a senior relative, like an uncle or a grandparent, intervening, listening to both sides and, and advising the two disputing parties to resolve the problem? And if the parties can't, all the problem by themselves, suggesting or advising to the parties the manner in which the dispute ought to be resolved. So it happens. It happens in routine society. It happens in highly structured environments as well, such as in commercial disputes. 
Then there is a process referred to as contractual adjudication. Uh, I'm not going to go into details about it, but look at the game of cricket. Look at the role of the umpire. One does the umpire do? When one party claims that the, that the batsman had got out, and unless the batsman voluntarily walks out of the crease and returns to the pavilion, the umpire decides on this dispute between the bowling side and the batting side as to whether or not the batsman has got caught. So he, he decides and everybody agrees to abide by that decision as part of the rules of the game. That is contractual adjudication. Of course, uh, it can be more complicated than the role of umpire in the game of cricket. Um, in constructions, you get in construction contracts, you get contractual adjudication of disputes between the contractor and the client. Be that as it may, the next process is referred to as arbitration, similar yet dissimilar to a court case. And I'm not going to spend time on that because it may not be necessary for you to know what arbitration is in great detail. And then this is what happens in court, judicial adjudication, judicial adjudication. Disputes are taken before court and judges decide on how the dispute should be resolved. And they pronounce what is referred to as the judgment <laughs> that will contain an assertion as to how the dispute should be resolved. And, and unlike negotiation, mediation, and conciliation, they are consensual processes. This is not a consensual process. It is a binding process. So ladies and gentlemen, the administration of justice is the process and the system that is in place for the resolution of disputes through courts. And the name given to this dispute resolution process is judicial adjudication. I will repeat, administration of justice is the system that is in place in any civilized country which provides for the resolution of disputes through adjudication. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we've completed one hour. Uh, I was asked to stop at this stage and open the floor for questions, but let me, within the next five minutes, uh, cover the remaining slides. Um, administration of justice, I'll have rushed through these slides. Administration of justice, that is hearing of cases, ladies and gentlemen, takes place in courts of law. So this is what, what really happens in judicial adjudication. There is a dispute between two or more parties. It's not a consensual process. So one party goes to court. Then obviously the other party has to respond by coming to court. The, the procedure that is followed to seek adjudication of a dispute is referred to as litigation. Um, the, the judge, Hears the case and he 
determines in terms of the law how the dispute should be resolved. So it's not an amicable process, it's a binding process. When there is a judgment, um, the person against whom the judgment has been delivered is bound to, to adhere, respect and adhere, the adhere to the judgment. So it's a binding process. And there are numerous participants in the administration of justice, uh, the umpire, and that's the judge, the disputants, the two parties who took their problem to court. They are also referred to as litigants. Uh, litigation and the administration of justice are complicated, highly technical processes, and therefore uh, litigants, ordinary disputants would find it difficult to fight their own case, though they have the legal right to do so in good 90% or even 95%, I would think. Uh, disputants obtain the services of lawyers as their representatives. They are also referred to as litigators. In a case, there is the necessity to present evidence of witnesses in support of the position taken up by the two sides. Uh, so you have witnesses as well. Uh, some are expert witnesses who have the right to express opinion, like scientists. Then there are court officials. There are law enforcement officers like police officers. And of course, in, in criminal courts, there are officials of penal institutions. That's a reference to prisons and various other correctional institutions. Uh, administration, is administration of justice is referred to as a public process. The public have a right to know what happens in court. Uh, all members of the public obviously cannot go to court and follow proceedings. And therefore, uh, media professionals cover court proceedings and they publish news items so that the people at large are kept informed of uh, proceedings in court. So media professionals also, uh, I think, have to be recognized as being participants in the system of administration of justice. Of course, the general public, the general public as well. Um, so this is like the anatomy of a court case. You have the two disputing parties, that's A and B. They go to court and they are represented by their respective lawyers. And of course, there is the judge at the center who decides the case. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I, would, I would like to introduce you to a few systems of uh, administration of justice that are available um, at national level, in other words, at country level, there are two main systems of justice, uh, referred to as the adversarial system of justice and the inquisitorial system of justice. Um, I, I am not going into details about the difference between the adversarial system and the inquisitorial system. Um, we have in Sri Lanka the adversarial system uh, stemming from our colonial days. Um, so in the, in the United Kingdom and in the entire Commonwealth of Nations, that's 48 countries, uh, is a system of justice that has been modeled to resemble the system that prevailed uh, in England during the colonial period. Of course, since then, we, our system of justice has also evolved uh, during the last uh, 74 years. 
uh, and we have certain very unique features in our system of justice. But broadly speaking, uh, our system of justice is quite similar to UK's system, and is is it's, this system is referred to as the adversarial system of justice. In in Europe, excluding the United Kingdom, in Russia, Japan, China, and in Latin American countries, the system of justice is referred to as the inquisitorial system of justice. I did forget to tell you that in addition to the Commonwealth of Nations, in the United States, the justice system is also adversarial in nature. Then at international level, there are systems of justice. Take, for example, the World Court, uh, referred to as the International Court of Justice. That's a court established by the United Nations to determine disputes between countries. Then there are uh, systems that have international courts that have come in to cater to specific eras, specific incidents. Take the Nuremberg Tribunal that was established in Germany after the defeat of Germany by the Allied forces to try Nazi war criminals who, who had committed war crimes. Then the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia during the disintegration of the former Yugoslav Republic into different Balkan states. Uh, there were very serious atrocities that were committed. And in the aftermath of the disintegration of Yugoslavia, the UN Security Council um, established the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. There is a similar tribunal that was established um, with regard to Rwanda. Then, of course, since 2003, the International Criminal Court has come into existence. So these are international systems of justice. And there is now a a developing area of justice where international justice is sought to be given effect to through national courts. I'll just leave you at that. This is referred to as universal jurisdiction as well. It's, it's a complicated thing. And since the majority of you are not law students, I'll just place it there without uh, attempting to describe what that is. Um, would you now have questions? Sir, there is a question in the chat. Okay. So, student, she wants to know if uh, you can give an example for the written law and unwritten law. Okay. Um, so, I, I would assume that, that that question comes from a law student. Um, 